that's it. How about you flash your lights if you can hear me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. It's good. Don't everyone amen at the same time. Well, good morning. Good morning to all of you. It's so great to see you, even though it's from a distance, and to see you through your cars. Just a reminder that you can have your windows down, uh, according to the uh, governor's guidance and the understanding of the North Carolina Sheriff's Association. You can have your windows down as long as you're six feet apart and remain in your vehicle. And we shouldn't have any issues. As long as we don't have more than 10 people over here, uh, we should be all set to go. We're just going to begin this morning with... Oh, Seth is sending me a, a, a technical message. Okay. We all set, Seth? Okay. We're going to begin with just reading from Isaiah 53 very familiar scriptures for us, beginning in verse 4. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we, est we, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut out, cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of God to crush him. He was put to grief. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered among the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. We certainly believe that this was a prophecy written long before Christ, but speaking directly about Christ, that he has borne our griefs and by his wounds we are healed. This morning we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. And on Friday we commemorate that Christ was crucified. And he was the sin penalty for us. He bore our sins. He bore our pains. He bore the judgment of God for our sin. And he died. Was dead. But today we celebrate that he is alive. So let's begin our singing together with Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery and let us behold the gospel story. Come. 
Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in Him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners, Hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold. Bringing many sons of glory. Grace unmeasured, love untold. Before we sing this last verse, it says, no grave could hold him. Listen to the words of Jesus. I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. The soldiers didn't have authority. Pilate didn't have authority. The whip didn't have authority. The spear didn't have authority. I lay it down and I take it up again. Come behold the wondrous mystery Slain by death, the God of life But no grave could ever behold him Praise the Lord, he is alive What a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes As we break bread, I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 20 in your Bibles. <clears throat> John chapter 20. Dennis, unmute your mic. Dennis, unmute your mic. Is that good? We good? I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 20. I asked someone last night. I said, yeah, you should be good. Was it on? 
Can somebody give me a flash if they can hear? Here? Good. <laughs> Yo, I'm way too enthusiastic. <clears throat> John, cha John chapter 20. <clears throat> I asked someone last night, have you read? I, I always, I remember when I was a boy, I always wanted to hear the story again. And so we're going to read the story before we break bread together. We're going to start in John chapter 20. You don't have to turn, but I'm going to give us a little backdrop. What happened the day before John chapter 20? The day before the resurrection, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how this imposter said while he was still alive, after three days... I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him. And that he would be claimed that he is raised from the dead, and the last fraud would be worse than the first. So seal it. Pilate said to them, you have guards. Here's a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken my Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciples, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look, he saw the linen clothes lying there. But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary, stooping, stood, stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be a guarder, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but to my brothers and sisters, and go to them and say, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked when the disciples were in fear of the Jews. Jesus stood, came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you give forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my fingers in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said for the third time, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, Thomas, but believe. And Thomas answered him almost the same thing Mary said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. If you're in your cars now, I want you to take out your bread and your cup <clears throat> And I'm going to pray, and we're going to hold together, and I'm going to lead us in taking the bread, not to lead us in taking the cup. <clears throat> Let me pray. Father, these last words, those who have <clears throat> not seen and yet believe, we are that group. We gather, having not seen and yet believe, because in accordance with Ephesians, you have opened the eyes of our heart. Therefore, we proclaim with Mary, we proclaim with Thomas, as we eat and drink this cup, my Lord and my God. Amen. And on that night, <clears throat> Paul reminds us, he says, what he received from the Lord, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that on that night the Lord Jesus, when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me eat together. Paul reminds them the history. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this covenant is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and as often as you drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, and may that be very soon. Let's drink together.
Don't you see the dawn of the darkest day? Christ on the road to Calvary. Tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome way. a moment and pray as we prepare to hear the word of God preached. Father, today we celebrate the power of the resurrection that raised Christ from the dead. Indeed, there is power at the cross to cleanse sinners, to make those who were your enemies your beloved children. The work at the cross causes those who were once your enemies to be your friends, to be welcomed near. The power at the cross, Lord, protects us forevermore from your wrath. There is no wrath that remains for your people. Oh, but Father, the power of the resurrection, it's power that brings life. It brought life to Christ Jesus, and it brings life to your people day in and day out. The power of the resurrection sustains us forevermore. Father, I pray that as Dennis preaches, that we, that we would love you deeper. 
That is my prayer, Lord, that our hearts would be open to receive the good word of God. Do your work among us, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. title of today's message is a pickup from Trent last week, <clears throat> the week that changed everything, and I mean everything, part two. One of the things Trent said last week is part one begins with a triumphal entry, and today will be the triumphal exit. But before we start, I need to say something. <clears throat> Today is not about the coronavirus. Today is about Jesus. But I do want to say something about the elephant in the room. Or we wouldn't be parked here if there was not an elephant in the room. All my life, I've never been at an Easter park in a parking lot. So let me say this about the elephant in the room. <clears throat> I don't know whether the coronavirus is here because of the, just the mere effects of living in a fallen world. This world was subjected to futility, and pandemics will happen. It could be just the rhythm of living in a fallen world. It could be God bringing merciful judgment on nations who have belittled and demeaned God. I don't know. It could be either of those, both of those, somewhere in between. I just don't know. But what I am confident in is that in either case, the coronavirus is here is to point us to Christ, the risen and reigning Christ. I have no question about that. You see, the coronavirus gets its orbit and gets its movement from a God who has allowed it. Last time we met was four weeks ago, the 15th. There was 100 deaths in the United States. In four weeks, there's 20,000 deaths in the United States. Five days ago, it's doubled. It was 10,000 five days ago. Today, it's 20,000. And worldwide, that number is 100,000. But it's not the death toll. There's been worse pandemics. It's not the death toll that's gotten my attention. I think what is so interesting right now is that 180-plus countries, all in virtual time, all at the same time, is looking at the coronavirus. And all 180 countries on this Easter I hope and I pray for God's mercy in the coronavirus, but what I hope and pray for more is that coronavirus and Easter is at the same time and that this coronavirus points toward our Christ. I just, I just emailed a guy from India this morning, and I know he's pantheistic, and I just shared the risen Savior in here, and he says, Amen. Everybody, is thinking about the coronavirus, I hope, today, and I hope they're thinking about Easter, how it points to Christ. There's a vernacular going around now saying, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard it, heard it though. We need to stay woke. Anybody heard that? Yeah. <laughs> you need to stay woke. It's a vernacular that's talking about stay awake during the middle of social justice. See what's happening and respond to it. Don't go to sleep. And so I hope to the degree the coronavirus will help the church not go to sleep. I hope we'll stay woke. I hope we'll be awakened because it's easy for us to be cavalier. It's easy for us to coast. It's easy for us to compromise. It's easy for us just to go through and play the role. And I know you know what I'm talking about. It's easy to get comfortable. And one of the things, it, it's easy for us to just pursue leisure. 
and pursue individualistic mindsets, which I hate. And then we lose the reality and it fades away of what God has called us to. Remember Matthew, I'm calling you to be my witnesses. I'm calling you to show mercy. I'm calling you to love one another deeply. I'm calling you to fervent prayer. When, is, when you felt that? I'm calling you to make every effort, everything God's calling us about, movement and passion and pursuit and urgency. To the degree I hope coronavirus helps the church stay woke. <clears throat> now, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and let these words help us stay woke. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We heard about John chapter 20. This is 30, 40 years later, and that message is still ringing. Listen to this. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you in which you received, in which you stand, in which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. Then he appeared to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and he appeared to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Verse 11, whether then it is I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain, and we should load up and go home. Emphasis added. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because he, we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Now that's weighty. Then... Those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who foreran you, if Christ is not raised, they have perished, brothers and sisters. If, Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death by a man, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ we are made alive. I have two things I want to do today <clears throat> with this passage. I got this idea, not with the resurrection, but the idea from Ravi Zachariah. He said every preacher who preaches needs to do two things. They need to put one foot on truth and the other foot on relevance. Relevance that matches the truth. One foot in truth, one foot in relevance. So I take that for Resurrection Sunday to mean this. I have two points. What is the resurrection truth? And what is the relevance of that resurrection? Resurrection truth, 
resurrection relevance. So first, resurrection truth. I think there's two aspects to this resurrection truth. One I call confessional truth. Not sure that's a word or a phrase. And the other one I call rational truth. There's confessional truth and rational truth. We just read confessional truth. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's one of the earliest statements. It's confessional. It's kind of this summary statement. It's a statement of faith is the way we talk about it. It's like a creed. It's a doctrinal summary of our salvation. It says these things. Listen at the first part. I delivered to you what I received. All of a sudden, this creedal communication, this summary, is a passed on faith. I delivered what I received. I delivered it to you. We just heard that this morning when we the Lord's Supper. I asked Logos. I said, Logos, tell me anywhere in the Bible where we received and delivered is used close to each other. It comes back with one. It said the Lord's Supper. Another creedal commitment that has been passed down for century and century. And here's the same thing he's saying with this gospel. It is passed down from century to century. What I received, I have delivered to you. And what he delivered was a message. And that message was that Christ died and that he was buried and that he rose again. And that message, he says, I gave to you, this confessional message, come to you in accord, in accordance with the scriptures. Now that is to communicate something about depth and breadth of the communication. When he says, I I brought this to you according to the scriptures, he's not talking about a verse. Do you remember when Christ was risen, he went on the Emmaus Road, And he was walking with these two. And he says, oh, you foolish and slow of heart to believe. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And listen, and beginning in Moses and the prophets, he interpreted all the scriptures concerning himself. This confessional truth is in accordance with the scriptures. This is not just a 33-year truth. This this truth has been going on since the Garden of Eden, from the fall of man, from the Exodus, from the prophets, through the Psalms. This confession of truth that is being passed down to you is the storyline of the whole Bible. But what is interesting in this confessional truth is what he adds and this repetition that he adds. It's not just a creed. It's something that he hammers at the end. When I say he arose, let me tell you a little bit about that rising. Notice six times. After he rises, he appeared, he appeared, he appeared, he appeared. It was important to the confessional faith that he appeared. Six times he appeared. And the emphasis is on both words, he appeared. It was not some twin. It was him. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He showed up. He showed up to validate exactly what he came to do. Therein lies your confession of faith that you should hold dear. It has been passed down from generation to generation. But one the second thing about resurrection truth that I love is just not just confessional truth, there's rational truth. When I say rational, I'm thinking logic, something that the historians look at reason. What's the best explanation for this thing, this risen savior what's rational about that when i was young i can remember argument after argument after argument it's kind of interesting to me that the arguments are fading in fact uh, gary habermas said that since 1975 2200 publications have been examined from english to french to german 
and 75% of critical scholars no longer hold to a critical view of the tomb. 75% recognize that the tomb was empty. Now that is people who are, may not be saved, who is given a critical thought. Is this story true? That's what I'm trying to ask you about rational. Is it, is it plausible to be true? You know, it, <clears throat> I was thinking, it's not rational. It's not rational to believe in the swoon theory in which Christ was pierced, blood and water comes out of his pericardium, he is laid in the grave, and he resuscitates because he wasn't dead, and he moves the stone away. It's not reasonable. That's not even rational. It's not rational for the theory that they had went to the wrong tomb that day. They went to the wrong tomb. If that would have been the case, the Jews would have never gone to the guard and said, let me pay you to say somebody stole him. They wouldn't have paid. They would have just opened the other tomb. Here he is. You just went to the wrong tomb. They didn't do that. They tried to pay him to make up a story. It's not rational. It's just not rational to believe that the, the disciples stole the body. If you remember when we read early in John 20, it says the disciples were locked in a room for fear of the Jews. Now does that sound like a group of men who's going to gather together to take on a squadron of Roman soldiers who are trained to defend ground, 16 of them? It doesn't sound like fearful men going to attack Roman soldiers, fishermen. It's not rational. It's not rational that they would go and try to break the seal that was put on the tomb by by Caesar, because if you break the seal that's put on the tomb, it is surely death for you. It's not rational. It's not rational to believe. Do you know who the first witnesses were of the story? Do you remember? It was women. In that day, a woman's testimony with something like this, a woman's testimony in court was worthless. You don't take this story down. You, if you want to create a legend, you don't say the women saw it first, and that is our witness. It's not rational that this age would have done that. It's not rational that the hallucination theory. You remember when Jesus walks into the room with the disciples? Show you my hands show you my side. Hallucinations don't generally happen in groups. And they don't normally happen seeing the same thing. There would be conflicting stories. Hallucinations don't usually say, press here. Feel the flesh. Feel the bone wounds. Feel the bones. And what impresses me over and over, it's kind of like, by the way, give me some fish. Give me some fish to eat. I don't think that was there mostly to talk about what our resurrected bodies will be like one day. I think it was, uh, I was here. Listen, if Joel comes into the house <clears throat> and eats half a pizza and he leaves and half the pizza is gone, I don't say, I must have hallucinated that. When Jesus ate the fish, the fish was gone when he left. There was no hallucination. The fish was gone. It's just not rational. Let me tell you what is rational and rational truth. You know when John went to the tomb, he looks in and he believes. They see the sin linen cloth and they believe. Let me tell you what I think they saw. <clears throat> I think it's in Luke. I think. The story goes that Nicodemus went with Joseph of Arimathea to the tomb carrying 75 pounds of ointments and spices to take the linen cloth, wrap him in the linen cloth, cover that with spices and ointments, and what I'm told is it hardens over time. And what I think John, when he walked in there, and he saw this linen cloth, 
shaped in the body of Christ, hardened and his body not there any longer, moving through the linen cloth like he moved through the door in the open room. He just goes through it. I think John looked in and said, I believe. There's no other way you could get out of that without just being, going through it. So that makes sense to me. It makes sense to me that he would validate his resurrection by showing himself he appeared, he appeared, he appeared. I, 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 so I was trying to think, what would it be like if Jesus would have just risen and left? Didn't talk to anybody, didn't show up, and everybody would be, where's he at? He appeared to validate himself to more than 500. That makes sense to me that he would do. And most of all, it makes sense to me that if this Jesus really rose 2,000 years ago, it would change lives. It would change lives then, and if it was true, it would, that would continue to change lives. Do you remember Peter? Weeks after he was dead in Jerusalem, right in the middle of it, when he's confronted, I deny him, I deny him, I curse, I deny him. Weeks later, listen how he talks on the day of Pentecost. You don't do this, you don't talk like this if something hasn't changed, especially Peter. He looked, stood up in the crowd, and he says to them, to to the Israelites, this Jesus whom you crucified has now risen. Therefore, you know what I'm going to say to you? Repent in the name of Jesus and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Who talks like that weeks later? Nobody. Unless something's changed. That makes sense to me. Why would 11 of the 12 disciples become martyrs? For an hallucination? Give me a break. They had seen a risen savior, and that makes sense to me. And the cause of 2,000 years later, I still look on Sunday mornings, and I see people who are changed. And that makes sense to me. And I look at my own life. I know I'm no longer the same. As feeble as it is, I know I've been changed. I know I have affections that are 2,000 years old. One of my favorite songs is Shackled by a Heavy Burden, Neath a Load of Guilt and Shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me. Now I'm no longer the same. That makes sense to me. Resurrection truth is about a confession. It's about a rational faith. And lastly, let me say something about resurrection relevance. I say this in two parts. What's the resurrection relevance for us as believers? I wrote this <clears throat> and I looked at it and I said, can I say that? If Christ's resurrection is not real, there is no good news. There's none. And even if, even if his resurrection is real and he doesn't resurrect me, 
That's not good news. The resurrection relevance, it guarantees your resurrection. And if Christ, I can talk like this. Listen to this. And if Christ has not been raised and our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain, if in Christ only is your hope in this life is this is the end and I enjoyed Christ and it's over, we are people to be most pitied. I didn't give my life for this to be over. I gave my life because he said, where I am, you will be also. I gave my life because he said, for as by one man came death, by a man also comes the resurrection of dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I put my faith in that Savior, the one who brings the dead back to life who will resurrect us. I put my faith in the one who says in Romans, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies. And that's where I put my trust. I'm looking forward to the resurrection of the dead. I'm looking forward with Paul. He is so clear to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he is so clear that to go now is far better than this earthly existence. But he is also clear, I am waiting for the clothing of my body when I die. God is going to resurrect your body. Your flesh and bone is going to be raised and transformed into a new life. That's resurrection relevance. I sometimes think, Lord, wrap it up. My father and my sister and my brother's body is in the grave. And I know they look forward to one day, like Paul, for that body and that soul to come back together in a resurrected body. Wrap it up, Lord. i say one more thing about for the believer. <clears throat> its relevance is not just a resurrected body. It also has resurrection power for today. You don't have to wait for the resurrected body. There's resurrection power now. I remember when I first used to hear that language, it was from my charismatic brothers, and I had no idea what they were talking about. What do you, it just sounded like, it sounded like some phrase to capture this momentum of miracles and wonders operating in resurrection power. But let me tell you what he, God has in mind. When Paul prayed to the Ephesians, he prays this language. I pray that you would have the eyes of your heart laid open. And what I want you to see with open eyes is the hope that he has called you to. This is the riches he has for you. It's the greatness of the power that he has in him. This hope, these riches of his glorious inheritance, and this power is what I want you to see. And the only way you see it in Ephesians, he says, is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I, I want that power to be in you so that you can see all that he has. And that's the relevance of the resurrection. Has our seeing become dull? I, I, I ask myself this question over and over. Resurrection power in how I see him. Do I see the fullness of him? Am I dull? We're getting ready to sing a song. It's called Build My Life. I'm looking forward to this song. Listen at the third stanza. It goes along kind of with his hope, his glorious inheritance, his power. Holy, there's not one like you. There's none beside you. Open my eyes in wonder. God wants to do that through his resurrection power. That's what Paul prayed. Open the eyes of their heart. And it goes, show me who you are. Fill me with your heart. 
Lead me with your love. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that can cause you to open eyes and see him and be relationship with him and be burdened and be passionate and be bold. We need resurrection power. The last thing I would say, <clears throat> what's the relevance? What's the relevance for the Christian? What's the relevance for an unbeliever? What's the resurrection relevance? I don't think it gets any simpler than this. <clears throat> it's in Acts 17, verse 30. He commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day. That day is fixed. Repent because he has fixed a day on which we, he will judge the world in righteousness by a man he has appointed. And of this he has given proof by raising him from the dead. The resurrected one is calling you to repent and turn to him. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is our story. It's the story of salvation. It's the truth to be believed in order to be in right standing with God and the enter eternal joy. And I ask you, if you're an unbeliever, will you be ready for that day? If you heard this story rightly, I don't know if you can come away with not saying that story, this resurrected one has a claim on my life. And it is real. He didn't go from Genesis to Revelation without claiming something. He has a claim on your life. Will you trust him? And I'll leave you with Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and because of resurrection Sunday, listen to this language. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you will be saved today. To God be the glory. Amen. Verse 1 again. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me 
with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. God for confessional truth, all that the Word of God says about the, an empty tomb, the empty tomb of Christ. We believe it. Beloved, we join the saints through the ages. The saints of the past, the saints of the present, the saints for all eternity, and confessing that the tomb that Christ was laid in is empty not because he was stolen, but because he was raised. Not because there was a mistake. Because it was foreordained that he would not remain 
dead. Death would not have its victory. And it is true that today we walk in resurrection power. The very power that, was, that raised Christ from the dead raises us to new life daily. I just want to pray for us. Actually, I want Paul to come pray for us. I, I just want, I want you to hear from all three of the elders today. Paul, pray for us. Brought back to us and reminded us of, of, us of again today. He's alive. Amen. He's alive. Listen, we've got a message of hope to share with all those around us. There are going to have to be opportunities all around us. I'm thankful Jen told me she was coming in this morning. She was just in tears as she saw all these people gathered wanting to proclaim the name of Jesus in all these various parking lots around our town today. Praise God that he's being pointed to today. Now, after today, if he does, if he tarries and he doesn't come, he's going to give us an opportunity to continue to point to him. You're going to talk to people about this virus and things that's going on. You're going to be able to minister to people that's going to have, that don't have hope right now. We have hope. Christ is alive. And he's changed us. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us for our sins. That's the message that you can go out and proclaim to people all throughout the community as you go forward. Lord, give us power. Give us eyes to be able to see you. And as we see you, may it impact our life that we might live for you. And that we might point to you. You're the hope that we have because you are alive. And you're soon to come. Lord, empower us. Go with each one of us. Use us in a manner that, that would be pleasing to you to point people to the great and glorious hope we have, which is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Him that died, came and died, was punished and was buried, but came out of that grave and is alive and is soon, soon, soon coming back. May we proclaim his name until he comes and may by his Spirit empower us to live for him. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus, and it's in his great and glorious name that we pray. Amen. 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 Listen, we're going to get out of here in an orderly fashion, so wait for your cue from Brother Brooks. We love you. We love you. We love you. He is risen. He is risen. Just as he said. Thank you.